The culture hero, the mythological figure who grants his people a civilizing gift, such as Prometheus granting the Greeks fire, is universal. In the 20th century, America received her own culture hero, Thomas Jefferson. Beginning in 1943, the Susquehanna centennial of his birth, Jefferson was removed from the arena of politics and made into the quote-unquote civilizing man. Merle Peterson, in his book, The Jefferson Image in the American Mind, does a very good job of describing what exactly this transformation looked like. In 1913, for example, he writes, William Lambeth and Warren Manning published Thomas Jefferson as an architect and, design and designer of landscape, which was the cornerstone of Jefferson later being declared the father of American architecture. In the sciences, Jefferson was declared everything from pioneer botanist to the father of American archaeology. In letters, Jefferson's love of the classics and language made him the man of the moment. Classicists, quote, applied his methods to the analysis of ancient verse, unquote, and anthropologists um, found in Jefferson's ruminations on languages, quote, anticipations of the importance of linguistics for the study of primitive cultures, unquote. And being claimed the giver of so many gifts, the crescendo was very easily reached on April 13, 1943, when dedicating the Jefferson Memorial in Washington, D.C., President Roosevelt proclaimed Thomas Jefferson the Apostle of Liberty, since in the words of historian Alan Nevins, Jefferson was, quote, one of the greatest liberators of the human spirit, unquote. But there was a problem in making this new culture hero of America the Apostle of Liberty. Of what liberty was he the Apostle? One of the themes that President Roosevelt made of Jefferson's bicentennial of 1943 was the theme that Jefferson would be a New Deal Democrat. And the whole philosophy of the New Deal was that the federal government had to grow beyond its constitutional limits. For example, in his State of the Union Address of 1941, President Roosevelt had articulated his four freedoms, two of which were freedom from want and freedom from fear. And this laid the basis for his second Bill of Rights, which he expounded in his State of the Union Address of 1944, operating under the idea that, quote, Necessitous men are not free men, since true individual freedom cannot exist without economic security and independence, unquote. The second bill called for the right to well-paying work, good education, and decent housing, to name three of the eight. It followed that a large government was required to bring these rights to fruition. And portrayed as a new dealer, Jefferson would have had to be for this expansion of government. But this interpretation of Jefferson, which was based on a few lines of a letter he wrote in 1816 to Samuel Kershaw, in which Jefferson wrote, quote, laws and institutions must go hand in hand with the progress of the human mind, unquote, completely ignored his strict constitutionalism. Uh, for example, Gordon S. Wood in Empire of Liberty relates how when the question of a national bank came up, Jefferson's response to the idea was no, since nowhere in the Constitution was the government granted the enumerated power to charter a national bank. Or again, in the October 1798 draft of the Kentucky Resolution, Jefferson wrote, quote, In questions of power, then, let no more be heard of confidence in man, but bind him down from mischief by the chains of the Constitution, unquote. It was Jefferson's intrinsic dualism. Gerald Johnson described Jefferson as a, quote-unquote, practical man with a, quote-unquote, poetic temperament, while Merle Peterson... Uh, expressing Lewis Mumford's view, described Jefferson as a Renaissance man, quote, who sought to transcend provinciality through the universal forms of the ancients and that of the American pioneer, unquote, allowed Jefferson to become the ultimate culture hero. Having no fixed point on the map, he could be anything to everyone. But this strength also allowed Jefferson to be knocked from his pedestal, as Jan Lewis and Peter Onoff wrote in 1998. As they explain, for example, Pauline Mayer saw, quote, an expansive conception of the revolutionary founding, unquote, where, quote, we must define and realize what is right and justice in our time, unquote. And as such, the meaning of the Declaration of Independence has no fixed meaning. And so Jefferson, in her book, American Scripture, is portrayed as a mere man surrounded not only by his contemporaries in Congress, but by ordinary people throughout the colonies who are writing their own declarations of independence. Or again, Joseph Ellis, who would have, quote, a little more John Adams and less Jefferson, unquote, portrayed the latter in his book, American Sphinx, as a perpetual adolescent. And since the chances of discovering the real Jefferson are still remote, it seems likely that Jefferson will remain, if not our cultural hero, at least our tabula rasa.